Deborah Hammond is our guest in this segment. She of the 27 books since she took up being an author. Deborah, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. 27 books. I am my working, goodness. I am working on my 27th. You're yes. a factory. That will be out uh, by the end of this summer. Yes. And what is the title of it? The title is Death in Lewis. Death in so, Lewis. So, as I'm sure you can appreciate, it is um, like mystery. The, the, and the ferry? Mystery. Cape May Lewis Ferry? That's the one. Well, I've spent some time there. As have we. That is our vacation destination Lewis. every year. And as they say, you know, write about what you know. So, And it also sort of borrows that whole homage to Agatha Christie and the small English village where nothing bad ever happens until it does. Until it does, yeah. So it's kind of an homage to that, too, because here's this picture-perfect town that's historical and, of course, a tourist destination. Nothing bad ever happens there until it does. Well, that's one of my favorite places. Yeah, Lewis. mine, too. So, mine, too. Uh, this is the setting of your 27th book. That, so you obviously you were the county administrator, and many people probably still remember. years. Right, for that. Yes. And then once you left that position, you began writing. The very first day. Yeah. W the was it kind of therapeutic day. at first or what? Well, actually, it was more a question of the fact that I'd always wanted to do it. But then, of course, you never have time. So I had four chapters of my first novel, and they're sitting in a drawer. Um, those four chapters had been written when I still lived in Wilmington, North Carolina. So, you know, 21 years before. And I said, well, now you have the opportunity. Let's, let's see if this can happen. That was March 5th. By May, I had my first draft. And I said, yeah, I think you're meant to do this. Now, before you wrote books, you still were a writer. Oh, because yes. when you would come in with the admiral <laughs> for the county uh, commission appearances, you would have four or five pages of points of conversation that were already laid out, and they were given to us. And, and Bill was adamant about following that point by point, <laughs> line by line. Not only those outlines, but everything Deborah told me, I was adamant and persistent about following to the Smart line. man, Bill. Yes. Smart man. Well, and that's just the thing, because, of course, in the, in the course of your work, you're either writing grants or you're writing reports or you're doing PR, in this case, for the county. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I, I do it for my books. Maria. And you just had um, an appearance, I don't know if appearance is the right word, but at the Roundhouse, you did For a, the Heritage Fair. Yeah, talk yes. a little bit about that and how, um, you know, the response of the community and so forth. Well, it was actually a twofold uh, involvement because my DAR chapter, William Henshaw, which happens to be the oldest DAR chapter in the state, um, were the sponsors of that. We were the okay. organizers. And my regent and one of our members are the ones that were actually responsible with Matt, uh, of course, Matt Umstead being the, the real uh, brains behind the operation. Uh, our chapter was involved in putting all of that together. Mm -hmm. So in addition to my chapter, there were three other chapters DAR chapters. There was the chapter uh, for the 1812 daughters. They were all there. So that was kind of the historic piece. Gotcha. And then there were other organizations related to the Civil War history of the Martinsburg Roundhouse. So there was that hat. And then my region had also asked me, you're a writer. Would you also be there with your books? So I was sort of wearing two hats, two hats. as is usually the case. Um, but so very happy to do so because, you know, we had, even though the weather was not the best, particularly on Saturday, we still had really good turnout. And it gives us the opportunity to sort of build on that. You know, we've already talked about what we'd like to do for next year. And maybe uh, there's some talk about making it a one-day event instead of a two-day event and adding some additional aspects to it. But any time that you can get folks to the Roundhouse, to me, is just a win-win mm -hmm. because that is just the most amazing structure in Berkeley County. And, you know, now, of course, the farmer's market is there on Saturday mornings, don't forget, because that's something that... You know, we also want to not only encourage the farmer's market, but, of course, its location at the Roundhouse. 
Yeah. Deborah, you've, you've written books from your experiences. You live in <laughs> Wilmington, Delaware, and Lewis, uh, I mean, <laughs> Wilmington, North Carolina, and uh, Lewis, Delaware. Will you be writing the book? from Martinsburg or Berkeley County? I've already written two. Oh, you have? Which yes. ones are they? Um, one is uh, an 18th century murder mystery set in Berkeley County. It's okay. called An Evil Moon. The first half of the book is in Berkeley County. The second half of the book is in Alexandria, Virginia. And it sort of touches on the uh, Scottish ancestors of both uh, Virginia here in Berkeley County and also, of course, in Alexandria, which was founded by three Scots. So there's a there's a aspect of that uh, that runs through the book. And the second, which is the one that is always of interest, I think it, every single event that I go to, people are very interested in. It's one of my time travels. I have three time travels. The one that's set in Martinsburg starts at the Roundhouse because, of course, it's West Virginia Day. Yeah. And um, the main character is transported back to the same day, but it's 1861. Mm -hmm. And so it's about the first few weeks here in Martinsburg of the Civil War and uh, the, the Union coming from Pennsylvania, the Union Army that came into um, Berkeley County and into Martinsburg. And it touches a little bit on spy craft and, uh, of course, touches on Bell Boyd and, yeah. and those associations. Well, you've written 27 books. That means you have 27 different ideas. Yes. For many of us, we have trouble <coughs> coming up with four or five original ideas. How do you find... Why are you looking at me when you said that? <laughs> well, I was trying to drive my point home, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you come up with that many different ideas, and how many more ideas do you have in your novel writing basket? Well, I will say of those... 26 that are print in print, the 27th, of course, being new. Um, some of those are um, sets. So in other words, there are three books in the Storm series. The first one was in the Eye of the Storm. Then there's Storm Chaser, Storm yeah. Season. So you have new characters coming into the books, but then you have characters that you were familiar with. And uh, The Big Sky and The English Rose, uh, likewise, it's the same family, but two different centuries. Um, I had written another book that was also in Lewis, uh, but it was set during the War of 1812 because, of course, of the famous bombardment that took place yeah. there in Lewis during the War of 1812. Same family, but then it's 1885, and um, one of their members have gone to New Mexico to start a cattle ranch. So those components were in both of those books, but... Again, completely different story because different century, different experiences. Do all a lot of the books, at least the books I've read of yours, <coughs> have a, a strong historical component to them? Mm -hmm. Have you written any books of a contemporary theme, such as twenty twenty one? Absolutely, and in fact, <coughs> pardon me. We can thank Rob Mario for that thank because you. you're welcome, everybody. <laughs> um, on one of my visits. Um, this would have been, let's see, this would have been probably book eight or nine. Rob asked me the question, well, do you think you'll ever write a contemporary story? And at the time I said, no, I can't imagine doing that. I remember that. And then I said to myself, well, why not? So it was just another challenge to set. And that was someone to watch over me. It was thanks to you because I then delved into contemporary issues and that is now a series so there are three books in that series is there a dedication to me in the book anywhere it was not <laughs> there's reference to you though Rob <laughs> it, it seems like if, if it's, the idea was brought about by me and I'm being thanked now there should be something about me in the book maybe somewhere. you're a character I, I, was, I was going to say maybe if, you were inspired maybe I was killed off by Gilstrap <laughs> yeah, there you in go. his next novel <laughs> yeah Going back to the county commission very quickly, of which you had a very impressive uh, uh, career with county commission, uh, the new um, uh, the new administrative officer was one that you were instrumental in hiring probably about 17 years ago. Yes. <clears throat> He's a wonderful guy, very, very smart, wonderful at budgeting, which, of course, is, you know, the middle and both ends of the work that we do. So... He will be a very good county administrator. We're talking about Gary Wine here, Gary by the Wine, way. Exactly yes. right, yeah. And he also has the ability of working with everyone, treats everybody the same. 
Absolutely. And of course, with his IT hat, you know, he's always going to have good ideas about what can we do to upgrade service here and what can we do to make information more readily available to the public. And, and that's that's key. Yeah, I um, I think Gary has been instrumental in the past. He's going to be into the success of the county, going to be even more so coming ahead because of the, posi- the new position he'll be, he'll be moving into. So. Absolutely. Deborah, let's talk about the county a little bit. So uh, you've been, what now, 10 years? Nine. Nine years. Uh, what mm-hmm. kind of changes have you seen in the county just since you left the county administrator job? Uh, well, certainly the same changes that everyone has seen, the, you know, the tremendous growth. It's of great concern to me, certainly, because uh, from the, just from the standpoint of water and sewer alone, it terrifies me to see what I'm seeing and knowing um, not only the improvements that have to be made, but the, ca- the capacity that has to be provided. So that's, that's terrifying to me as an observer, a former planner, and a former county administrator. Uh, But, you know, we hope for the best. We hope that the rain continues because we were very worried for two months when we didn't have rain. Those of us who have been through droughts before know what was coming. Bill talks about that because you were the county administrator at the time when Bill said that at one point we were at, what, a day day supply of water, Bill? Uh, in, In Inwood, a day supply of water. Absolutely. We've been there. So if you have been there, then you, even though you're no longer in that position, you have the terror of what can come because knowing the drawl, just the daily drawl of all of the growth that we have experienced, it's very frightening. But one thing about the growth, Deborah, and we've been very fortunate in this because we do not have regulations to to achieve it. It's the Z word, Bill. You can we say have the it. Zoning. Yeah, we do not you have can say we it. do not have zoning. Uh, <laughs> most of the growth has been along the I eighty one corridor. So therefore we've concentrated our water needs and our sewer needs. If they would had the same growth spread out, say Back Creek Valley or sections of the northeastern part of the county, uh, would be in real dire trouble just now. But the growth has been very centralized, and that's been our advantage. Well, I agree and I disagree okay. because as I'm traveling to Hedgesville, as I do every Friday when I go to see my hairdresser, I'm seeing a lot of townhomes being built closer and closer to Hedgesville. So that's of concern, again, for those of us who have lived that and have experienced it. A lot of those, though, in the Hedgesville area are on public water. In public sewer. I'm talking in the more rural areas. Okay, then that's before where before you get to Hedges. That's where we're going to have problems when we depend upon our wells and our septic tanks. Our wells more so than a septic tank. Interesting thing with a septic tank, and you Deborah knows this, probably to others as well. Uh, septic tanks rarely fail upward; they fail downward. In other words, if you have a failed septic tank. You do not see it very readily. Um, it's uh, You could be polluting the groundwater, you could pollute in the area around you, but you as a homeowner are not aware you have a problem with that particular septic tank. Until you have a problem. You, you, Guilty. Yeah. I had a problem with the septic system, and it was the worst time yeah. of... I'm, but, I'm going to quickly take us away from septic <laughs> yeah, discussion. Let's go somewhere else. On let's, the go back to the, let's go back to books. Yeah, that'd be great. But before we do that, though, I want to... I want to go back to the economic crisis, 2009, 2010, 2011, uh, getting through that uh, in doing an interview with, uh, I think it was Dan Delier, might have been Doug, I can't remember, but I remember them telling me about the rainy day fund at one point early on in their tenure towards the end of yours was down to being measured in dollars, maybe less at that point in the economic turndown, I'm sure was a huge factor. Now, tell me about guiding the county through those days. Well, I like to say, and I think pretty much anyone who's ever been in government would agree with me, that if you're steering through calm waters, um, it is not a challenge. You have day-to-day issues. When you're not steering through calm waters, that's when the backbone is required. That's when the spine is required. And we had incredibly difficult decisions that had to be made. And fortunately, we sailed through those difficult waters. We sailed back into calmer waters, even though 
with the growth, of course, there's never really a calm day. Um, and by the time I retired, that rainy day fund was close to $2 million. So we worked it back up. Bill talks about the water situation and being within one day in Inwood. Were you ever in crisis mode financially in the county during those times where you were one day away from running out of money or one day away from panicking because the county couldn't pay its bills? Well, fortunately, we always had resources that could be reallocated. Um, and, you know, we saw that recently, unfortunately, at the federal level when Janet Yellen is having to be concerned about, okay, can we move here? Can we move here? Can we move here? And you have to do that. You have to do that. We also had surplus property uh, because of the fact that we had moved to the Dunn Building and into the Judicial Center. So we had surplus property that we could sell, that we no longer had to insure and pay, of course, utilities. So there were other avenues that we could um, utilize in order to raise funds. But to give you a, a quick indication of what that uh, downfall meant to the county, from one year to the next, we went through uh, roughly a million dollars in planning commission fees being raised to 200,000. 80%. Sure. So that gives you just one revenue source of what we were facing. But there's another, there were tough times. Another aspect of that as well, uh, and I think we're talking about the 2008-2009 uh, era. Uh, if we kept on our path, we would have had that one day of running out of money. Uh, Ron Collins was president at the time. I give Ron phenomenal credit. He took a major corrective action mid-physical mid cycle, and uh, we cut back every one of the other offices, other elected offices, by a substantial amount. I'm 20%. thinking around 20 percent was mm -hmm. that much. Uh, it was a, a, a real belt tightening, and the other elected officials were not particularly happy uh, because they had their spending already mapped out. Uh, but Ron stood firm, said, we've got to take this action, and that avoided that one day of running running out of money. So Ron deserves credit. That's a great story, Bill. I had not heard that before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Deborah, just about two minutes left here, so let's get back to your books there. When does Book 27 get released? Um, book 27 will be released by the end of the summer. Um, I have um, an event coming up in July and also one in September, so it'll be between that period of time, probably mid-August. And the title of it will be? Death and Lewis. Death and Lewis. And uh, like all 26 prior novels, they are available on Amazon.com and also at local events. Will you be doing local signings? Absolutely. Where, yes. do you, where do you like to go most? Well, of course, some of the avenues pre-pandemic are no longer available to me. So uh, that's why doing the events, such as the Heritage Fair that Maria referenced, uh, it's just a wonderful way to be able to reach out to um, to my local readers. I also love to do events with churches. So I'm at St. Leo's, I'm at Harmony United Methodist Church, uh, St. John's Lutheran. And um, I'm meeting new readers, but I'm also getting to interact with uh, readers that I've had from the very beginning, which is very gratifying. In your new book, in all your books, there is a villain. In the past, they have been finally, uh, very uh, scantily disguised with Rob, Bob, Rob <laughs> Benedict. Are you? No, no, I'm the person. Are you, thanks, are you making a little bit more effort to hide Rob's true identity as you outline a villain? Well, I don't think anyone would mistake this particular villain, who is called Mr. Big throughout the book, until we find his his actual true identity <clears throat> with Rob, because. Rob is such a gracious person, and he's a good person, and this gentleman is neither. You mean, not. You mean yeah. I unintentionally set Rob up for uh, for compliments? You did. Deborah, would you like to co-host Everyday Bill is on? <laughs> I would love doing that. You know, because this evil I get across from me every day needs to be counteracted by good. <laughs> Everything's good. good. That's, why you, that's why you had all the chocolate, because it was to sweeten him a little. <laughs> that's right. <laughs>